welcome to the latest A Spotlight On interview. Today I'm joined by Derek Morris, who is a Senior Lecturer in Biomedical Science at the University of Galway. Um, we're going to be talking about risk genes for psychiatric disorders today. Without further ado, Derek, could you introduce yourself um, and tell us a little bit about what you do? Hi there, Lauren. Nice to speak to you today. Yeah, my name is Dr. Derek Morris. I'm a senior lecturer in biomedical science at the University of Galway. Um, my background is in science all the way. So I, I did a degree in biotechnology here in Galway before doing a PhD in molecular genetics at Cardiff University. And that's really where I got into the area of psychiatric genetics. Uh, I follow that up by taking on a postdoctoral position in Trinity College Dublin. I was a visiting research fellow in the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard University before becoming a a lecturer in Trinity College Dublin and then moving to a lectureship here in the University of Galway at the end of 2013. So my research interests are in psychiatric genetics and that's about understanding or identifying risk genes for common psychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia, bipolar, major depressive disorder. Um, and you know the main goal of what I do centers around kind of a central question and one way to kind of look at that is to maybe ask what's the difference between a disorder and a disease? So one answer is that a disorder is an illness that disrupts normal function, whereas a disease is an illness with a known biology. And my research is really based on trying to turn psychiatric disorders, which is the term we use, into psychiatric diseases, which is a term we don't really use. And we don't use that term because we don't really understand the biology of these illnesses. But importantly, these disorders have a high heritability, which means that genetics play an important role in causing these illnesses. So my research is trying to exploit that, trying to find the risk genes for, for example, schizophrenia. And if we can find genes, we can understand what proteins are involved, what biological processes are involved, and from there, try and understand the biology of the disease. Yeah, it's a in really interesting um, area. So I'm really excited to get into um, some of these questions. Um, but first, I'd love to know, like, what sort of inspired you to go into this specific area of research? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, it it uh, stemmed really from even in, in my kind of secondary school, uh, I had an interest, big interest in biology and in kind of genetics specifically. I remember watching a program, a, a BBC Two documentary one time, which described, uh, you know, how the size of the human genome and many bases may be in it in terms of the A, C's, G's and T's. And I had an interest in mathematics and an interest in biology. And I, I think when the two of them are combined, uh, you can have an interest in genetics because it can be quite kind of computational and mathematical as well as biological. Um, and then when it came to, you know, getting into my postgraduate study, um, uh, I was interested to do a, a PhD abroad at the time and there was different offerings, but the one in, in Cardiff was quite attractive uh, and it happened to be in the area of psychiatric genetics. So I hadn't specifically picked psychiatry up, up to that point, uh, but during my time there, that lab has, you know, since then, you know, established itself as a world leading laboratory in terms of uh, psychiatric genetics. So I was very fortunate to get some really good training there. And I've ended up kind of remaining in that field over the last 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, OK, so um, could you tell us a little bit about the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium? Yeah, so the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium was formed uh, in around the, the late noughties or into kind of 2010, 2011. And it was off the back of an initial wave of what were called genome-wide association studies, or GWAS. So GWAS uh, occurred in the mid noughties and they were the first application of these SNP chip technologies that led us to be able to analyze uh, large numbers of genetic variants across the genome and to assay them in both patient samples and in controls, and then to compare the data from patients and controls to try and find genetic variants that have different frequencies uh, between the two samples, which would point to what we call a genetic association, which would help identify risk genes for the disorders. So initially, uh, we formed what was called the International Schizophrenia Consortium in uh, into late 2006. And that brought together about eight institutions uh, from mostly from uh, Western Europe and from North America, uh, who had collections of schizophrenia patient samples and controls. And prior to this, there had been very little kind of data sharing or, or kind of sharing of samples between sites, samples or individual institutions and laboratories were often quite kind of protective of their data and weren't too keen to share it. Um, but what the initial GWAS studies told us was that for GWAS to be effective, 
we needed very large samples of patients and controls. And the reason for that is that it turns out that common genetic variants, which, may, which contribute to risk of these disorders, um, have relatively low effects or low odds ratios, which means that you need, need large samples to be able to detect true associations. So that really forced uh, laboratories and institutions to come together. And as part of the International Schizophrenia Consortium, we had two major papers in Nature in 2008 and 2009, looking at both rare copy number variants and common SNPs. Um, and these are the, some of the first uh, major genomic studies of schizophrenia. So, but off the back of the International Schizophrenia Consortium, there was a, a recognition in the field that the consortium needed to open to more institutions and also to extend to the study of other disorders. Uh, so it now comprises hundreds, if not thousands, of investigators um, who pool and share samples and data for the purposes of gene discovery. And it has extended well beyond schizophrenia to now include other common disorders like uh, ADHD and autism spectrum disorder, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, but also disorders like Tourette syndrome, anorexia, uh, uh, and, and others. So uh, it's it's huge and varied. And you know the uh, the website actually is a great resource for both the public, for scientists, and for clinicians if you want to learn more about the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And um, you sort of mentioned there, but I think it'd be interesting to delve in a little bit more about just why is it so important to have this sort of like collaborative um, work going on, especially particularly um, in this sort of field. Yeah, so so pre GWAS and pre um, the kind of genomic revolution, which came off the back of the you know the first draft of the Human Genome Project, uh, the Human Genome about. Uh, 20 years or so ago, there'd been a lot of genetic investigations into psychiatric disorders like other common disorders in, in cancer, cardiovascular disease, you know, asthma, respiratory disorders, you name it. Um, and these largely had been what were called candidate gene studies. They largely focused on individual genes and individual laboratories with maybe a few hundred patients and a few hundred controls undertook analysis. Now, occasionally they would find significant associations but invariably these associations didn't replicate when they were studied in independent samples, which is a key uh, factor for genetic associations. You need independent evidence to support your initial statistic findings in case you, your initial findings were false positive results. And um, uh, there was also, so, so there was that recognition that we needed kind of bigger samples uh, to be able to detect initial associations and also to be able to replicate them independently. Um, the GWAS chips were, were not cheap, and all of this research uh, was going to cost huge amounts of money. So therefore, funders uh, were needed were going to, to stump up for that. Uh, but in response to that, the funders, for example, the Wellcome Trust in particular, identified that they would only fund, it, uh, fund this type of work if large kind of uh, groupings came together such that sample sizes of sufficient size were available. And there was also a recognition that whatever data was generated needed to be made available down the line for other researchers to use it and reuse it to try and get as much out of that data. Um, so, uh, and again, primarily the, the main reason these large sample sizes are needed is that the um, individual genetic risk variants, for example, SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms to individual changes in our DNA code. We've got millions of these in our genome. And for the common ones that contribute to, to risk of different traits and affect different phenotypes, uh, they only have uh, low, uh, small amounts of effect. So there's only a small amount of increased risk associated with carrying a particular allele at a particular schizophrenia risk SNP. And to, uh, so what that means is that when we compare patient samples to controls, the frequency difference between those uh, two samples in terms of allele frequency is relatively small in the order of, you know, one, two, three percent. So to, to detect a statistically significant association where the frequency difference is so small, you need very large samples to have accurate measures of allele frequency in your patients and in your controls. And that is, is the main reason why uh, large samples need to be collected. And what we've learned in the, in the 15 years since the initial GWAS were undertaken is that as samples get bigger, uh, there's an immediate payoff in terms of the new risk genes that we identify. The more samples you have, the more power you have to detect these uh, low effect associations. And that has driven gene discovery in, in psychiatric disorders, but also in, in lots of other common disorders as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess this kind of links into that as well then, but 
why um, so neurodevelopmental disorders are polygenic. Um, could you just explain a little bit like what that actually means um, and how it can sort of impact how we study and treat these disorders? Yeah, so um, so polygenic simply means many genes. And for, you know, again, pre-GWAS and even in the early GWAS era, there was a lot of debate about uh, what was the, the genetic architecture of these, dis these disorders, how many genes might contribute. So we knew from older linkage studies going back into the, the 80s and 90s was that schizophrenia wasn't a, a single gene disorder like a Mendelian disorders like a cystic fibrosis or a Huntington's disease. And actually the scale of its polygenicity has you know, uh, gone way beyond what any of us might have expected. Uh, and that is that you know, current studies, even though we're finding hundreds of risk genes for schizophrenia, uh, the truth is that there, there may be hundreds among thousands that are actually in our genome. So, so there's, there's many, many variants that are contributing uh, to risk. Uh, and again, because these, of these low effect sizes, uh, it means that we need very large samples to be able to detect them. Um, in terms of what it means in terms of treating the disorders, uh, to treat the disorders, we need to know, we need a better understanding of the biology. And again, we're, we're trying to drive that biological, new biological understandings. We're trying to drive that uh, via genetic discovery. So if we find the genes involved, we can understand the proteins that are contributing. We can understand the biological processes that are involved, the cells and the tissues that are involved. And from there, hopefully develop um, uh, new drug targets uh, and be able to improve uh, treatment. So, so as yet, you know, in terms of treating these disorders, uh, the new genetic studies haven't yet had an impact, uh, but it doesn't mean that they're not being successful yet. It's just a, a long road to translate genetic findings into new treatments. Yeah, so you, you've sort of gone on to um, treatments there. Um, could you provide us with a bit of an overview, I guess, of what treatments are currently available for um, schizophrenia in particular um, and why like our limited knowledge of the underlying block biology is sort of impacting on effectiveness of these treatments? Yeah, so, you know, current antipsychotic medications that might be used for schizophrenia, are used for schizophrenia, were discovered by accident nearly 60 years ago. Uh, and um, since then, there's been few major discoveries in terms of uh, new medications uh, that have uh, become available for patients, uh, which is pretty shocking. If you compare that to other common illnesses and disorders out there, uh, whether it's cardiovascular disease or cancer treatment, et cetera, you know, there's been revolutions in terms of new treatments that are available to treat disease and prevent disease, et cetera. But sadly for psychiatric diseases, uh, there's been relatively few breakthroughs. And even for the medications that we do have, they were only partially effective. So they're effective for some individuals and not others. They're effective for some symptoms of the disorder and not others. So they're, they may, could be effective for treating uh, positive symptoms such as hallucinations and delusions, but they're not so effective at treating uh, negative symptoms and cognitive deficits. And it's those aspects of the disorder that are often kind of most disabling and prevent individuals that are affected from leading you know, normal lives in the community. Um, and that results in what we call functional disability. So, so we really need to get a handle on the biology of the illness so that we can identify new drug targets. And again, that's where our genetic research comes in. If we can find the genes, we can hopefully find the targets uh, that will encourage uh, new drug development. So I guess traditionally, why has it been so tricky to understand the underlying biology? Does it sort of just come back to lack of genetic knowledge um, or what, what's sort of going on there? Yeah, so it's 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 a lack of genetic uh, knowledge in terms of cause. Um, I mean, as a brain disorder, I mean the brain is is pretty inaccessible. So, in compared to disorders that might affect other tissues, you know, we can't get tissue samples to undertake a biopsy, etc. So, we're relying on you know collecting clinical data on patients. We can collect behavioral data on patients. We can um, do neuroimaging studies to look at the structure and the function of the brain. And we can combine that with genetic studies. So, so we have to find alternative routes to try and understand the pathology of what's happening and identify the molecular mechanisms of disease. And um, given the, again, the inaccessibility of the brain, and it's also incredible complexity, uh, it is proving very challenging. But uh, again, genetics is, is a route into a route to solving that problem, and that's what we're trying to exploit. 
That's great. Um, so I guess we'll move on a bit more to like some of your recent work um, more specifically. So um, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about the paper that you published earlier this year, um, where you and your collaborators identified genomic regions affecting schizophrenia risk. Yeah, so this um, was the, the latest paper by the Psych Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. And what it represented was, um, since the previous kind of major paper in, in 2014, and there was another one, major one by colleagues in 2018, um, what it represented was further efforts to, to collect larger samples and undertake bigger GWAS to identify more risk loci, uh, as well as combining it with uh, data sets that have been collected from other um, regions, uh, uh, primarily from Southeast Asia, but there was also samples from Africa included in the study this time around. And in line with what I said earlier, that as the samples get bigger, the more loci we're able to identify. So, so th that was so it it succeeded in in doing that and and finding between two and three hundred uh, risk loci for schizophrenia. Based on that, then there was various analysis to look at the tissues and particularly the cell types that were affected. Uh, there was a big drive towards with fine mapping to try and identify causal variants. So, so a big challenge in genetic studies is that when we, we do a GWAS and we find a region of the genome where common variation increases risk of illness, there's a big challenge then to try and figure out of the common variants that are present at a region, uh, which variants are likely to affect gene function and how, and based on that then uh, form hypotheses about how those genes may be contributing to disease. Um, so there was uh, advances in terms of fine mapping uh, techniques um, and then there was also overlap with rare variant studies. And some of the headline results then kind of really related to that. A lot of the risk genes that were identified when we look at their function, a lot of them map to neurons and specifically are involved in synaptic function. So the synapse is the, the kind of a, a connection point between neurons where one uh, nerve cell transmits information to the next nerve cell. And a lot of the genes that that are risk genes for schizophrenia encode proteins that function at the synapse. So it really gives us an area to focus on in terms of biological advances. That's um that's a great overview. Um so yeah, you sort of mentioned there, or start to mention about how um some of these sort of areas will mostly they map to the neurons. Um what does this or does this actually have an effect on schizophrenia symptoms? We don't know the answer to that yet. So, so obviously it does, um, you know, it does suggest that the molecular mechanisms of disease are certainly uh, at play within neurons and again, specifically at the synapse, the connection point between neurons. But how exactly that's resulting in the symptoms that patients experience, we can't yet answer. Um, but it's part of kind of follow-up analysis where we, where we can specifically look at genes with synaptic function and start to uh, correlate that and compare that with, you know, different symptom profiles in patients because different patients present with different symptoms. Um, and hopefully that will, uh, you know, start to generate some, some answers to the question that you just asked. But as of yet, we don't, we can't kind of make that firm causal link between the synaptic bio biology and the symptoms that patients experience. Yeah, um, so you obviously sort of mentioned there sort of follow-up research. Um, you might not be able to tell us in great detail about this, but what sort of areas are you looking to work on? Um, or perhaps what, how do you hope that your research might lead to new sort of research avenues um, for other researchers as well? Yeah, so what these big GWAS studies do is they identify, you know, again, hundreds of risk genes across the genome that are contributing uh, somehow to disease risk. The next big challenge is trying to take those results and build on them to understand, for example, how individual uh, genetic variants affect gene function, uh, be more certain about the exact genes that are involved, uh, look to see which of those genes may function together, where they may function, what they may do, and understand some of the, the biology that's there. Uh, in our laboratory, we've taken a particular interest in, in genes that, are, that function as transcription factors during your development. So what that means is that they're genes that regulate the expression or of, of other genes that control, you know, which genes are turned on and turned off during brain development, uh, because these genes are often associated by GWAS, kind of rare mutations in these genes often cause uh, severe kind of developmental disorders and intellectual disability. Um, so what we try and do is exploit data, which gives us a map of the genes regulated by these transcription factor genes 
and look within these particular networks to see um, how genetic risk, uh, to see are they enriched for genetic risk of schizophrenia firstly, and if that's the case, maybe what cell types are being affected, uh, at what points in development uh, the, the effect is, is um, occurring. Um, so, so again, th these GWAS are really a, a kind of foundation for lots of different advanced biology and computational science to try and understand the biology that's involved. That's really interesting. So are you looking more into sort of transcriptome analysis now in, in your research? Uh, we do at different levels. So um, so there's transcriptome analysis available in psychiatric research. There's some that's available on post-mortem brain samples from patients and controls. Uh, but another big area is to look at is to use uh, single cell analysis. And we have several projects in this space. So single cell analysis uh, or single cell RNA sequencing analysis particularly is based on being able to look at the transcriptome or look at gene expression patterns in individual cells. Uh, previously, uh, gene expression analysis would often have re relied on bulk tissue. So that may be for, from a specific region of the brain, such as the prefrontal cortex. Uh, but when you get a sample like that and you perform gene expression analysis, what you're getting is expression data mixed together from, from genes that are expressed in lots of different cell types. What single cell analysis allows us to do is to separate out the individual cell types and look at the expression patterns uh, in each cell type, uh, for example, in different types of neurons compared to oligodendrocytes, compared to glial cells, etc. Uh, and what that lets us do then is that when we get GWAS results, what we can look to see is of the genes identified by GWAS, we can look to see which particular cell types those genes have high expression in or, or specifically high expression in. And what that helps us identify then is the individual cell types where the molecular mechanisms of schizophrenia may be at play. That's also important in the context of drug development because I've been to several uh, presentations by researchers from the pharmaceutical industry, and they will always highlight the importance of knowing what cell type needs to be targeted with the drug. Uh, so hopefully if, if the genetic research and the single cell analysis can proceed, we have a better idea of the important cell types for schizophrenia, and that gives the pharmaceutical company, companies a narrower, a narrower target for their drug development activities. Yeah, I mean, actually what you just brought up there is quite a, a key sort of challenge, I guess, with the, when we talk about treatments for psychiatric um, disorders. Um, so, I mean, is that something with single cell analysis coming through, is that something that hopefully will progress a bit more? Hopefully we'll see a bit more investment from pharmaceutical companies in, in these treatments? Yes, hopefully, as, as I mentioned, um, for, the, from the, for the pharmaceutical companies, identifying the cell types uh, is, a, is a key uh, aspect that needs to be um, addressed. So, um, so there's lots of, of exciting new research coming out to look at um, or, or try and compare schizophrenia risk genes and their expression patterns in cell types, not only um, uh, at, at different cell types from different brain regions, but also looking at different stages of development because um, you know, we understand that schizophrenia, we often describe it as a neurodevelopmental disorder, which means that in part schizophrenia is due to abnormal neurodevelopment, even though it, you know, individuals don't present with symptoms until their late teens or early 20s. But it, it's likely to be in part a consequence of, of the brain not forming properly or correctly, whether that's sufficient synaptic connections or whatever it might be. So as well as, as looking at uh, cell types involved, we also need to think about uh, which cell types uh, are, might be affected at which time points in development. So, uh, so lots of effort to, to try and do that. Uh, so it's supported by single cell analysis that's available on human brain samples, but there's also big resources that are made available studying the mouse as a model organism. And um, so even though mouse and, and human are uh, different, uh, obviously, um, there's lots of similarities in terms of the biology of brain function. Uh, so those big single cell resources for mouse are helping us identify, you know, what cell types might be important for schizophrenia. Okay, yeah, that's um, that's really interesting. So, um, I guess we'll we'll change over a little bit from from that paper, um, because I also wanted to ask you about um, another one of your recent papers, which focused on maternal immune activation. Um, this isn't something that I've come across before. Um, could you explain what this means and how it impacts psychiatric disorders like major depressive disorder? Yeah, so uh, maternal immune activation or, or MIA is where 
a pregnant mother experiences, for example, a bacterial or a viral infection, and that results in an immune response. And that immune response can have an effect on the developing fetus, and in particular, it can affect brain development. And what we know from epidemiological studies is that this represents a risk factor, not just for major depressive disorder, but for many neuropsychiatric disorders, uh, schizophrenia, autism especially. Uh, so what it is, is, it's an example of an environmental risk factor. We'll be mostly talking about the genetic risk factors for these disorders, but of course these disorders are caused by a combination of genes and the environment, nature and nurture. And uh, MIA or maternal immune activation is an example of an environmental risk factor. Um, and this is something that we've been able to study, uh, like other groups, in an animal model. Um, and that's where uh, uh, we can try and understand the effect of uh, an immune response. We can look to see what the effect of that is on the brain function of offspring and try and relate that back to human studies. Yeah, I think um, it's an incredibly interesting area. Um, you mentioned there the sort of environmental impacts um, on the development of these disorders. So could you tell us a little bit more about what um, gene environment interactions are um, and why it's so important to study these? Yeah, so gene environment interactions occur when effectively genetic risk factors and environmental risk factors combine together to increase, increase risk of illness, kind of above and beyond, you know, an additive manner. So each might individually contribute to risk, but a gene environment interaction, maybe when the when you've a genetic factor and an environmental factor, if, if an individual is subject to both, uh, then perhaps there's a, a multiplicative increase in risk. Um, they're important to study because it helps, it helps us understand, uh, you know, how uh, gene function may be perturbed by environmental influences. It helps us understand how uh, uh, the environmental factors may be uh, functioning, um, but it, they are difficult to get a handle on and they're difficult to study. So you need genetic data and environmental data. So genetic data is easier to collect uh, because an individual's inherited genome and the common risk alleles that we have in our genome, uh, those that are inherited from our parents are largely stable and constant over a lifetime. So, so one genetic analysis using a SNP chip as part of a GWAS analysis will, for an individual, catalog the different alleles they have in their genome, um, you know, over the course of their lifetime. Environmental data then is harder to collect because obviously it varies over lifetime, and it's and it's there's, there's a huge range of of different factors that you can collect data on, whether it's maternal immune activation, uh, whether it's kind of major uh, psychological stress stress at different time points in life, whether it's uh, use of uh, cannabis, whether it's uh, other traumas, etc. Um, so it's best to try and collect environmental data prospectively using a longitudinal study, uh, which means that you try and recruit individuals into a study and collect data on them at different points in their lifetime effectively. Uh, so that's both expensive and time consuming. So, so, but there are large kind of biobanks collections underway that collect such data. And over time, hopefully we'll be able to, to better uh, form gene environment interactions. But at present, it, it is hard to pinpoint to any specific gene environment interactions that we can, you know, be confident are, are, are true associations and, and replicating independent samples. Yeah, um, I mean, you might not have an answer for this, but are there any sort of developments or new technologies in this space that could help with collecting that sort of environmental data? Um, or is it just a case of having to wait it out and do the longitudinal studies? Yeah, look, there are, you know, various... Um, advances that that are are useful i mean part of it can just be you know effectively collecting uh health data you know with patients consent over time and that's is facilitated more when hospital systems have electronic health records and um and again if those individuals consent to be part of large studies that combine their health data with their genetic data uh, that's useful we've obviously kind of got wearables and modern technologies you know with our watches our phones etc which do collect data uh, on our behavior and some aspects of our physiology. Um, now, in the areas that we're interested in, um, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, psychological data or uh, in neurocognitive data, um, that data isn't as easy to collect individually over time in large samples. But certainly for other uh, types of, of um, studies, such as in cardiovascular disease, et cetera, um, a lot of the data that's routinely collected uh, by our the, all the technologies we use and wear, et cetera, along the way, can be used um, again with patient consent as part of uh, major, you know, investigations of, of gene environment interactions. Yeah, 
Okay, um, so I guess um, one area as well that might particularly and perhaps um, help with this would be like as um, whole genome sequencing is decreasing in price. Um, does what would this mean for the field? I guess or for your research, would it have like a particular impact? Yeah. So so cheaper whole genome sequencing means uh, that it's obviously more affordable, and it means much like the SNP chips that we can do genome sequencing on larger numbers of samples. So why would we do that? So when we, um, when, for most of the major studies undertaken to date in schizophrenia have focused on common SNPs. So these are changes in the DNA code where the two possible alleles are common or both are frequent in the population. However, there's other types of variants that may contribute um, to schizophrenia risk and they are rare variants. And that's where uh, the change in the DNA code is relatively unusual and very infrequent uh, in a po in the population. Uh, so when we undertake SNP, SNP chip analysis as part of GWAS, what we're doing is, is just assaying or measuring the common variation across the genome. It doesn't, it tells us little about the rare variation with the, with the exception of, of very large deletions and duplications called copy number variants. So if we want to find more of these rare variants, uh, we need to be able to sequence chromosomes essentially from end to end in each individual patient sample in, and in a control and use that uh, to identify rare variants that may increase the risk of illness. So in tandem with the, the um, PGC uh, schizophrenia GWAS paper that was published in, in uh, Nature in April of this year, there was also a, a second major pub paper published based on what was called the schema study. And this was a study that used a combination of exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing to look at rare variation in schizophrenia. So just briefly, exome sequencing is where we sequence just uh, the exons of the genome as opposed to the full genome. So it's only about 3% of the genome. And for a long time, it was you know, a lot cheaper than whole genome sequencing, but that's uh, slowly changing. Um, and the reason we st study the exome is that um, it's easier to interpret variants, rare variants in exons, because we can predict what effect they're likely to have on, on protein structure and function, et cetera. Um, there's a whole other area of research to undertake, which is to look at rare variants outside of protein coating regions. Uh, they're also important, but it's going to take a lot more work to be able to interpret those. Um, but the outcome of the schema study um, was to identify 10 schizophrenia risk genes across the genome where there was an excess of rare mutations in patients compared to controls. And again, this gives us valuable insights into the life and possible biology of the illness. Um, importantly, there was some convergence in terms of the, the biology in, uh, in that compared to the GWAS study. So some of the same genes were identified and uh, some of the same biology was also identified. So that's very encouraging. Um, and of course, the identification of, of genes that have rare mutations uh, immediately helps us identify what are likely to be the causal variants uh, for those uh, individuals that carry those mutations. And therefore, we can start to model them a little bit easier in cellular models, et cetera. So, um, so going forward, I would see that the gene discovery process for schizophrenia will, uh, will continue with both of these arms underway. I think GWAS will continue. Uh, they're going to expand to populations of different ancestry around the world, and uh, they look to identify more risk loci. But there's also going to be a big push to do more sequencing studies and to use that to drive rare variant discovery. Um, and the two in combination hopefully will give us greater insights into the genetic basis of the illness. Yeah, and I guess basically just get more data. Um, so you mentioned there um, that you identified like 10 genes, I think you said. Um, will, will future work sort of focus on looking into those in a bit more detail? Yeah, so uh, again, in comparison, in, in GWAS studies, uh, where we identify a risk gene or risk locus, what we're identifying is a common variant and other variants in high uh, linkage disequilibrium with it, which means that they're they're inherited in, in um, uh, a correlated manner. And But often it can be difficult to uh, move from the genetic variant to the risk gene. So, it, and that's because because of this high linkage disequilibrium, the association signal can extend across multiple, you know, three, four, ten genes at a locus, and therefore it's hard to figure out first of all which gene is affected, and then secondly, the DNA variants. You know, inter, even if we know which gene it does affect, how does it affect the gene? Does it change its expression? Does it change its function, etc.? Um, so that makes it challenging then to be specific about which genes to bring forward for functional studies. When we do rare variant analysis, 
And um, so even though the schema study identified just 10 genes as opposed to 200 plus from the GWA study, for those 10 genes, what we have is a catalog of, of specific mutations that affect the gene function and it affect the protein function. Now, often these are what are called loss of function mutations. So it means that there's a, a change in the DNA code uh, that stops the protein from functioning or else there may be a missense variance, which means that they change the amino, an amino acid in the protein, but the consequence is that it functionally impacts on, on protein function. So that gives us a more specific handle on the causal variant at that gene. Uh, and therefore, uh, again, if we want to model that in a cell uh, or in, in, in a, maybe in a brain organoid or, or, or some other uh, type of, of model to investigate function, it means we've got a more specific idea of exactly what genetic lesion or what genetic mutation we need to study, what particular uh, gene is involved, what the effect is on the protein, and, and trying to, again, understand what the biological consequences of, of that are on cellular function. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> so um, just sort of moving away from that, um, and, and kind of going back to the April paper, um, one thing I, I think you mentioned in that, or something that comes up a lot with um, genome-wide association studies is around the lack of diversity. Um, and I think there's something you tried to incorporate in that um, April paper. Could you tell us a bit more about how this lack of diversity can impact on genetic findings um, around psychiatric disorders? Okay, so the issue around lack of diversity is that GWA studies over the last 15 years have predominantly been based on um, Caucasian samples uh, of European ancestry collected either in Europe or maybe collected in North America. Um, there's also been collections elsewhere, such as in Australia, etc. There has been collections of more diverse samples, for example, African-American samples collected in the US. Uh, and there has been um, more recently some large collections of samples, for example, in East Asia. But there's many parts of the world where that are underrepresented or not represented at all in genetic studies. Um, now, uh, the PGC has made progress in this, but there's there's a lot still to do. The progress that has been made is that there has been a large East Asian GWAS undertaking of schizophrenia uh, that was published by Lam et al. in 2019. And importantly, in that, firstly, when they compared the GWAS results from the East, A East Asian samples to the European-based samples, uh, they indicated that the genetic base of schizophrenia and its biology was largely shared across the population. So, so there aren't different risk genes uh, in, in one population of one ancestry compared to another. Um, however, uh, the polygenic risk scores that were, uh, when, they were uh, when they attempted to transfer them between populations or between ancestries, that wasn't really effective. Uh, and what that highlighted was the importance of clues, including you know, sufficient samples of different ancestral groups to ensure the, uh, that we can generalize across populations when it comes to polygenic analysis. Um, so uh, polygenic scores are where we combine, where we take an individual's genetic makeup and we look to see based on the alleles that they have a common variance across their genome, how much risk they carry for, for example, schizophrenia. And, and you can generate similar scores for your risk of breast cancer, for your risk of prostate cancer, for your risk of cardiovascular disease, et cetera. Um, and there's a drive towards uh, potentially making some clinical use of these data. So what we certainly know so far is, or certainly for psychiatric disorders, these uh, polygenic scores are not or cannot be used to predict, you know, if you're going to develop schizophrenia or not. But they could point to, they could have some use along with other risk factors uh, when clinicians are trying to determine you know the best uh, uh, course of treatment for a patient so they, they, they sort of they can have some uses um, but um, what we know is that at present the only useful polygenic risk scores that we can generate are largely based on individuals of Caucasian ancestry and that and what the study of the East Asian samples told us was that if we want to generate polygenic risk scores for individuals of different ancestries, we need large GWAS based on those ancestries. Um, uh, and this is important because if you want to include polygenic scores as a as part of a, a clinical workup, you know, in a in a hospital in a major uh, cosmopolitan city that's made up of individuals of lots of different ancestries, it's completely unethical to make that treatment are those options only available to people of one ancestry and not another ancestry? Um, so if we want to incorporate polygenic risk scores into the clinic, uh, 
uh, we need greater diversity of underlying GWAS, uh, which which we and it's those it's the polygenic spores are based on those GWAS. So so we need that greater diversity. So that's why there's a big drive to try and recruit and, and collect um, uh, patient and controlled samples from different ancestries around the world, and not just to collect data and and you know move it to a European or US base for analysis. There's very much a, a push towards trying to have uh, local colleagues uh, working, undertaking genetic analysis uh, and uh, working in their own communities and their own universities around the world uh, on this research. Yeah, it's an incredibly important um, area for sure. Um, so I think that kind of leads quite nicely um, onto uh, my final question, which is around, um, I guess, like, what does the future neuropsychiatric landscape look like to you? Um, and do you have any hopes or wishes for future developments? Yeah, look, it's um, it's still where are we at? So I think I remember reading a very good review article 10 years ago, and it was, I think, entitled something like G was the beginning of the end. And it was the idea that now that we could undertake GWAS, uh, we were, um, uh, or sorry, it was the end of the the end of the beginning. So um, it was making the point that uh, we were just at the, uh, in terms of the, the timeline through from gene discovery through f functional biology to translation for patients, we were just really at the end of the beginning, uh, which was the gene discovery phase. And ten years on, I still think we're there. <laughs> Because GWAS hasn't gone away, it's actually got bigger, it's got more powerful, and it's kind of and what we've discovered is that the complexity in terms of the polygenicity and the many genes contributing to these disorders is far in excess of what we could ever have expected. So therefore, there's still a lot of work going into uh, GWAS and gene discovery. So I still think that we're getting towards the end of the beginning. Um, and from here, then the major challenges really are about turning genetic findings into disease biology. Um, and whereas, again, we can find, you know, hundreds of risk genes or maybe even thousands of risk genes, there's a lot of fu functional follow-up work that needs to be done on those genes almost individually to try and figure out how genetic variation affects their function, how that affects cell biology, and what the consequences then is for the brain and for patients that carry those, those, um, uh, uh, those variants in their genome. Um, you know, and, and that then again is, is a, a basis for new targets for drug discovery. Uh, I'm hoping maybe one wish would be that as we make these kind of genetic findings, maybe there might be some wins in terms of drug repurposing. So one thing that's possible uh, with um, is when we when we know which risk genes are contributing to a disorder, there's lots of drugs that have already been developed, you know, for use in other uh, illnesses, etc. Uh, and it's possible that some of those drugs may end up targeting some of the genes and proteins that we're now finding to be involved in schizophrenia. That gives the opportunity to maybe repurpose those drugs for use in psychiatric disorders, whereas you know previously that wasn't thought to be sensible or, or, or even a possibility. Uh, and I think that drug repurposing might be a way towards identifying some initial new treatments for patients and kind of keep the momentum up to show that these genetic studies have the potential uh, to improve patient outcomes. Uh, because, um, uh, again, repurposing drugs is, is a quicker option to developing new drugs. But new drug development is something that needs to happen as well, but it's just going to take a lot more time. Yeah, I think obviously that would that would be fantastic. Um, but yeah, like you say, it's a sort of route to a quick win. Um, the research still needs to go on in the other areas. Um, that that's really great. That's actually all we've got time for today. Um, but I've found it incredibly interesting. I've learned so much about risk genes and psychiatric disorders. Um, so I just like to say thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Thanks very much. It was my pleasure.